Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, drummer for Low Cash and Nashville's Claire Bowen, Harry Myrie, and now Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Rich Redman here. That's that time. Another episode of the Rich Redman Show. Joined, of course, by my friend and sidekick, Jim McCarthy. Jim sidekick. McCarthy voiceover. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we'll take turns. I'll be Batman. You be right. Robin. Sometimes you're more of a Robin <clears throat> You when you kind of take over the conversation. But you haven't been doing that, man, really. Like, we've got a nice thing that we're, this kibitzing thing that we're back and forth. It's like early pong you know atari like you're 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 handling the interviews very well we're getting it down we really are we're almost a hundred dang episodes in in. well see even right now it's zoom it is this thing is not happening but um i'm really excited about today you know it's just that time what jim what do we do on the show who do we talk to we talk to uh all sorts of different people musicians actors comedians thought Thought leaders. I would think, you know, there's a lot of drummers that are, they've got some deep yeah. thoughts, especially today. Yeah. You know, our guest today, Jim, you're going to have so much in common and I go back. It's eight years with this young man. And I'm so proud of everything he's been able to do, but he is a originally hailing from Birmingham, Alabama, a staple of the Nashville drumming scene since 2013. He's been touring and recording with folks like low cash, Claire Bowen, Ryan Falaze. I love the Falazes of hot shell, Ray Hardy, Levi Hummond. And he's staying busy. Plus, he's a serious YouTuber, man. He got the uh, YouTube Creator Award for surpassing wow. 100,000 subscribers. So he probably That's knows about Casey button, Cooper. Right? Yeah, it's the silver, which probably looked really good in his house. I don't know. I can see it. It's right there in the shot. Ladies and gentlemen, our friend, Harry Myrie. Oh, Myrie. <laughs> we were, how are you, man? We're trying to put the right syllable on the right emphasis or the emphasis on the right syllable. You did so much better than most people do attempting that name. Harry Myrie. Harry yeah. Myrie. I think hi, Harry Myrie. Well, how, how did I introduce you at the drummer's weekend? Which one did you come to? Was it 2014? I'll never forget it. It was 2015, a turning point in my life, man. Oh, well, that, you know what? I didn't. I really didn't know that you had that much fun because when you came to that camp, I think it was the first annual, second annual. Um, it, it, um, you seemed so confident, like you had this whole thing together. I mean, you went to the Berklee College of Music. You know how to play a song. I think you got up there and played a All Along the Watchtower or something like that, and you just nailed it, man. What a memory you have. Uh, <laughs> I, I was just trying to channel my inner Rich Redmond. I... Dude, the one thing I still carry with me from that weekend is I had never spent more than five minutes around you before, but you actually sat at drums and completed the circle for me of like, of course, you're really confident and outgoing, but the (laughs) drumming side of you is this concrete, immovable object, man. You just like set this tone of, by the way, also to do this at a high level, you just have to be fucking ridiculous at the drums. And that got in my blood and I never forgot it. Man. Well, that is so sweet to think, man, because I, you know, I, you know, the way you play, I feel like we're, I don't know, we're, I think we're one or two, I think we're maybe two generations removed from each other because I just celebrated my 50th in Joshua Tree. And when I think about your influences, I think it's no secret that you were highly influenced by Carter Beaufort from the Dave Matthews band. You even got to hang out with the guy. I would say you, I mean, he probably texts you or sends you like weird memes or gifts or whatever. He's sending you like a weird Chanaka Christmas tree or something right now in your phone. You better check your phone. But, but I mean, to be, if you're calling me good and you got like a drummer like that, that's pretty cool to be in that same category. Insane. And uh, you, you, uh, you and Carter remind me of one another in a lot of ways in that uh, when I, it doesn't take but five seconds to go. Yeah. That's Rich Redman on the, that's Carter Beaufort on the drums. (laughs) Uh, That's the three line with like all of my favorite drummers, man. So y'all are cut from the same cloth. As far oh, as man. I'm concerned. Well, thank you so much. And I tell you, man, you are, um, you're a success story, man. I mean, you are coming to us from a, a you're a homeowner, the house mm-hmm. that drums built. Yeah. Um, you're over by Vanderbilt somewhere. I'm not giving away your address, you know, unless you want me to, you got a girlfriend or you want me to kind of like <laughs> advertise this and ladies, uh, I, I, I'm an introvert, man. I like being left in the quiet over here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you didn't answer my question, girlfriend. What do you think? 
Oh yeah, no, I've been <laughs> I, I've been with the same girl for the last eight years. Wow, but you, yeah. you're so young. What are you like, thirty two years old or something? Like I that? just turned thirty two. Yeah, so How it's did almost I know? over. That's incredible, man. So, <laughs> so the same girl. What does she do? She writes songs, man, and she just sings her face off. Like um, that's a really good influence in my life too. Like her musicality is undeniable. Like. The, my favorite thing about living here is like surrounding myself with people that are so ridiculously talented mm -hmm. that my shame turns into motivation and I just accidentally naturally get better. You know what I'm saying? Wow. So it's obviously a musical household. It could potentially be a musical family. Maybe there'll be a little drummer boy running around at some point here. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, I would be offended. You would be offended, right? If you didn't get the call to play on her records, right? I mean. Oh, I, I have politically have forced myself onto all of her recordings for uh, many years now, but uh, man, she works with, she works with so many good producers who, uh, don't, they don't even bother using drummers anymore. They have like samplers and make cooler parts and they do them in 30 seconds. And so yeah. I, I'm out of the equation. And there's, it's nice to have a professional separation in the house, not step on each other's toes in our work lives. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, Birmingham, Alabama, like Nashville is funny. Like I've been, you know, for the last eight years living part-time in Los Angeles, I miss the sun. I went for a walk today. It looks like Birmingham, England out there. I mean, I'm ready for like a dragon to like fly over us. It's so dark and gloomy out there. No way. Are you in, uh, you, as in you're in Los Angeles right now? And you no, I'm in, the sun? I'm in, I'm in oh, Nashville, yeah. but I miss the sun. Yeah. I, I, oh. Yeah. But I'm going to yeah. Florida for the holidays to see my folks. I don't know about you guys, but I've been taking a lot of this this year. Zinc. Mm -hmm. That's Jim, what have you been taking to fight the COVID? <laughs> Zinc. What, yeah, just zinc. I mean, multi-dosing uh, this, vitamin and, uh, C. Noon. Noon. It's yeah. like a like a, a supercharged vitamin or something. Uh, there. Uh, this one's for immunity. So okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because you know, Centrum. You know, Centrum is affordable, but it always ends up in the in the toilet somehow. You know, it's like uh, it, it doesn't right digest through. all the way. You know. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of these things they say you only only ingest about twenty percent of this anyway. You know, yeah, supplements are expensive. Plus, they're not evaluated fully by the FDA, so I don't know. I don't know what the value is there. Are you a supplementer, Harry? Well, aren't you also taking peace of mind? I, I pop. I think this is bus culture, kind of like placebo. I, yes, right. You you can for five dollars or whatever the bottle of vitamin C and vitamin D takes, which I do it too. That, that seems like a bus thing to me. You get to tell yourself the story. You get to have peace of mind. Like, look, man, I put good stuff for me. I can proceed in my day with confidence and not be afraid of everything. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. it, I mean, sometimes it just comes out as a, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Jim's got sometimes some new samples and he's just, he's watch out. This is a it crucial part you. of the Rich Redmond <laughs> show, man, is the sound effects. Oh God. Well, so Harry Birmingham, how did it all start for you? Like, when did you pick up the sticks? Who was your first, how did you, you know, cause for me it was MTV. So like, how did this all start? And you end up at the Berkeley college of music and then yeah. you moved to Nashville just right up the way from Birmingham. Yeah, totally, man. I thought I was one of these kids that thought I was trying, I spent my whole young life trying to get as far away from home as possible. I honestly thought I was going to end up in Los Angeles. That's where like all the records I've ever loved got made out there. Sure. Uh, it seems like a weird accident that I ended up in Nashville, but I went where the work was coming sure. out of college, man. Uh, I, I felt, it felt a little, it's from a musical perspective, Alabama felt pretty culturally barren to me. Yeah, right. Uh, so do you, like spending a summer at Berkeley and actually meeting other people who have the same dream as me uh, was the first experience in my life of, oh, the, the like-minded people are out there. There's not an Alabama. I just have to get out of here and I'll be right. okay. So it was just one summer at Ber uh, Berkeley? You didn't get your degree or, or what? I, think I did three summers at Berkeley through high school. They do little oh. recruiting programs. Through high they like train you up to get a scholarship. And it's, it's like the Rocky Balboa montage where you're in the practice room for eight hours a day. Yes. And you're, uh, you're like pulling a sled like a dog in the snow. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> making those noises. <laughs> <laughs> Hitting the meat. No pain. Just no punching pain. people on the street for no reason. So three summers. So you had to be a pretty advanced player to probably get it into a program like that. Where who is your teacher in Birmingham? Because I think I've done some teaching over there at the Birmingham Music Center or the music, the School of Music in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. you might have been to Alabama School of Fine Arts. That's the only 
remotely funded artistic educational entity in all of Birmingham. Right. Um, and that's one reason, boy, do I love that y'all sponsor. I wonder if it still is school of rock. Yeah. We love the school of rock, man. We do. What, a, uh, what, a, what a game changer. Yeah. I, and, um, I, some friends of mine and I founded a, a similar fledgling program in Birmingham called Scrollworks. Same idea. There's so little educational funding there that, uh, music, you know, you, you cut your budget and music goes first out the window. Always. Yeah. So there's all these inner city kids that don't like have not seen musical instruments with their own eyes. And that can kind of like you're asking me about, like e each of us have gone through this touching a musical instrument like that for the first time in your life. If it speaks to you, that can change like your entire trajectory. trajectory. <laughs> I would be dead in a ditch right now if it weren't for, I just feel that way. I wasn't good at anything else. And the, the drums were the first thing that gave back to me what I gave to them. So like, I, I'm so lucky for that. Well, did you, and I, and I, man, I'm so happy for you, man. And, and, and did you end up, uh, did you have a penchant for sketch comedy and comedians? Because all of your videos on YouTube have this very cool angle. I mean, I, you told me you were spending some more time in Los Angeles. I really hope you get a headshot and an agent because you could probably do some stuff. We should do like some short films or something together. Some little sketches. I have an idea that I wrote a year and a half for you. Um, and I'm not ready to shoot it with you yet. And I'm sparing, you're a busy guy, so I've spared you the time until now. I'll pitch <laughs> it. Wait, basically, we're about, 10 per, we're about 10 yards away from end zone with the sponsor. Um, and uh, I, there's this thing you'd be perfect for, man. And we'll do it up in Los Angeles. It involves a green screen. Uh, whoever's listening to this like two years from now, I hope that it's out by then, man. We're going to do it. Um, I, I'm glad you asked me this. I love though, that. Man. Because I don't identify as a funny person. I think the reason there's humor in my videos is everybody else in my life is so... I'm like the least funny person in my life. Uh, and it, but it comes through my writing, man. Just funny stuff. Like that guitar player, Dylan Jones, that played with me in Falaise is so... Like I had physical pain all the time from how funny he was. And so <laughs> much of his sensibility like makes it into my videos. Because a lot of those guys aren't very... Self, the world will never know who a lot of these side musicians are because they're just immersed in their craft. They're not very like self-promoting types. Yeah. And it's enough for them to like play music and leave it all out on the stage. And so in some ways, I think I'm trying to like keep all these unknown musicians alive in my life. They're the funny ones though, man. I just steal from them. Well, Jim, Jim would really appreciate this because Jim rode me like Seabiscuit for years and said, man, you got to, <laughs> you have got to get something out that really shows people what it's like to be a side man, a working. And so he had whatever camera he had at the time and he followed me around for like a month and we called it like a week in the life, kind of like very guerrilla documentary. Um, gorilla, like this. gorilla style. Sounded like, this is the kind of sounded a vote. It's painful. <laughs> it wasn't, it was, it was a, you did a good job, Jim, especially since we all know publicly that you love making film, but you hate editing film and you saw it across the finish line. But, you know, see, but this one, that, that project was a, was a fun one because it was inspired. Well, it's because we're we're good pals, you know, and we're having yeah. another f guest on today that you did a vid sig <laughs> with. Johnny Rapp only, is going to come on after took, Harry. It only took seven years to get. To well, here's the deal. <laughs> See, Harry is a young whippersnapper who has great video editing skills, knows all about that kind of stuff. So he says, you know what? I'm getting this work as a sideman with these great artists and we're playing all these killer, you know, mm. amphitheaters. We're playing for 20,000 people a night. I'm going to capture this. And not only that, he did a video describing the financial truths of what it is to be a working side man. I'll, I'll say at the entry to mid-level recording artist, right? So a brand new major label artist or a semi-established. And then he did the whole thing with his spreadsheets and said, this year I made $11,264 with, and, but I played 180 gigs. And then two years later, he's like, I tripled my income played you know less shows it, and he sh like he pulled it all back and i don't think you sold anybody out because it's such a small town you can't do that right mm -hmm. but yeah. the response from that video i mean you're brave you're bold you're ballsy i love that you did that man wow i, I wow, love you that uh yeah i love Thank those you. types of videos yeah Man, thanks for checking it out. I was so nervous about putting that out. Like you said, it's a it's a small town, and uh, the anonymity of everybody that I've worked for was very important to me. I've yeah. been on certain gigs where it's a firing offense, 
to even tell the guy sitting next to you on the bus how much you're getting paid. So, uh, I, uh, I, I tried to, um, be as transparent as I could, but like protect, protect the innocent, so to speak. Well, you could, be, yeah, you could and, and be protecting people that want to get into this and they go, Oh my God. I, I, cause you know, the message was if you're really going to be paying attention to every decimal point, maybe music isn't right for you. <laughs> well, it's funny you know what I mean? in, a, in a meritocracy, uh, it, it is talked about constantly how much people make, you know, like I always talk about my years in the car business. It was my first experience to where they literally put how much each salesperson made on the board for <laughs> public. Really. Cons- I mean, even customers yeah. can walk by and peer in and see, Oh wow. <laughs> hey, PJ is the number one customer. She made $14,000 last month. And it's like one of those things you're going, Oh my gosh, this is completely foreign to me. You mean the number one salesperson? Yeah, but I mean, yeah, yeah. that's a meritocracy. That's yeah, where yeah. you earn every dollar you get. You know, it's uh, accountability type of merit based income. Well, but yeah, the, I can see, you know, not discussing that with. I mean, but the, the, the interesting part of the music business is that we have four meals a day catered to us. We have a professional driver. We will have some sort of a nice bed. We have help setting up and tearing down the drums. So, what they're saying is you're making this day rate to play 20 minutes in front of a, a crowd as an opening at 20 to 45 minutes, right? Yeah. So that's not a hard day's work, but the deal is you're gone. Your bed is moving. You're in different, you're getting paid really more for your lifestyle and the fact but that you can't have a pet or keep a cactus alive. Do, do young ones coming in, yeah, you can't really have too much of an anchor at home, but do young people coming in understand that that lifestyle is that you're getting a paycheck, you're getting paid to see the country, you're getting your meals, all the basics are pretty much taken care of, and you have all this time on your hands to operate and work on other things, other, other income streams, right? Mm-hmm. That's the that's the realization. Yeah, that's what Harry does during the day. Right. He creates. That's what you do, but do a lot. A lot of people don't realize that, right? Yeah. Is that is that the case you find? Yo, well, that's that's the tone that Rich has set for a lot of us, man. Like he, I, my sense, Rich, is that you put the bus to use. So last year we went to Pensacola to play the Pepsi Gulf Coast Jam. Yeah. And uh, I. I'm so excited. It's so uh, I was playing with Low Cash at that time, and we were direct support. We were going on at 9:30. Al Dean was going on at 11 or something. And you can cut this out if you don't want this story told, because I have no idea what happened. I just remember I was going up on stage, and I overheard a tour manager say he had these like radio people gathered around, and he was like, "Yo, uh, let everybody know there's no meet and greet tonight. Uh, Mr. Al Dean is not feeling well, so just cancel the meet and greet." And then we go up on stage and we play our 75 minute set. And we get to the end of the last song and we're really like blowing the last of the fireworks we have, man. We're going, and our poor monitor engineer, we're like trash canning. And our monitor engineer, who was like 20 years old, this was like his first road gig he'd ever had. He gets on the mic on the talk back that just goes to our ears and he goes, Al Dean is not here. Al Dean is not going on. You have to keep going. Don't leave. Don't get off stage. And we had, we, I think we must have gone on while we were trying to figure this out for 60 extra minutes, playing these silly cover songs from the eighties that we had no business playing. And the crowd is gradually starting to look up being oh like, my God. I think something's wrong here. And you know, promoters are going back and forth with managers trying to negotiate. Are we staying up? And then some poor MC had to come out and explain to this giant crowd of people who had been waiting since 11 AM uh, in the sun and d- dehydrating Drunk. themselves from alcohol. Like, Hey, so, um, I hope you guys had a good time today. Al Dean is very unwell. I think he had gotten food poisoning or something was, yeah. was the word. And he's not here. And I never, that entire day, I never, uh, I never ran into rich and deep down. I knew the reason is because rich like is efficient with his time. He'll go on stage for that 90 minutes, but he's not going to let the other 22 and a half hours go to waste. That was the explanation in my mind. I wish you had told me that you were there so we could have connected. Oh, my God. So what um, what act were you with? Was that Claire Bowen or what was that? Who was that? Was that low, low cash. cash. OK, yeah. you know what? You know what? We were talking about generations. Um when I was, I moved to Nashville in March of 1997, the same exact time as Jim Riley, right? So we're on the same kind of trajectory. And I started doing showcases. Now, I was playing demos and doing showcases with Low Cash in 1998. They were dance instructors at the Wild Horse Saloon. And their music, I, I got to give it to them, they never gave up. They kept changing the music with the times and putting a new group of people to, behind them. And they would re-showcase. And they, it finally <laughs> happened for them, man. And you end up, ended up playing with them. Very cool, man. Yeah, dude. I like They... Um 
I, I'm so thankful for the influence they've had in my life, man. I, um, from a, yeah, from a distance, you might mistake them as one of these transient country acts that comes and goes or something. But what you're saying is so true. And it shows in their, uh, their spirituality, kind of the way they work. Like they just, they approach things with this blood. Th- they are proudly like the, the, the cockroach or something. It's like not even the, a nuclear meltdown can kill them. They just will keep going no matter what, man. stay on the scene no matter what. Yeah, I have so much respect for that. Like, they, dude, nobody on their bus works harder than them. And I yeah. like those kinds of environments, man. Yeah. Well, you put together a nice little, you know, um, resume for yourself so far in eight years. Uh, Ryan follows a man. I used to do demos for his dad and I used yeah. to teach his brother, uh, Jamie. <laughs> and and yeah. I played a bunch of tracks on a Hot Shell Ray record, and then they realized, hey, um, let's get the old man off the drums because this kid Jamie's pretty good. And so they ended up keeping all of Jamie's tracks. Were you doing Ryan's like pop country thing that he was doing? Or yeah, totally. He had a big de- he had a deal on Big Machine uh, um, yeah. for a couple of years there, and he uh, man he was opening for us every night when I was playing with Low Cash and. I'd, I'd sit on the side of the stage and watch him every night, man. He's, I love his live arrangements and his, he had, like that, he brought that hot shell Ray thing into country. There's some, there's something that feels different on stage about the way he processes music. And I got so hooked on that and hanging out with his people. And they had, when, when it was time for them to tour with Sam Hunt, they wanted to do the Ableton thing. And so I built their rig for them and, yeah. um, and, and got to play with him for maybe a year or so. And it's like, I feel so lucky for that. That song tonight, tonight, right? Uh, is probably I've just I've I've never seen an ocean of people who don't even necessarily speak English like all be on the same page in such a heavy way. Like that song is like the center of that experience for me, man. Dude, I love so cool. that you got to do. Who were you? Tra- was it who were you touring with last when the pandemic hit? Uh, I I had but the last. The, the last time I was on stage this year, I was doing a drum festival in Vancouver. Um, and then I think by the, by the time I got home, society had shut down. I knew I wasn't going to play with low cash anymore. I know who I'm playing with next whenever society resumes, but I think it's like not necessarily my place to say who that is yet. Yeah. Although I can, when we shut it down, I'll mention it to you. Okay. I have no problem with that. Well, you got a, you got a gig to look forward to. That's wonderful. And in the meantime, Hello. I mean, I'm confused uh, my, what to even talk about next because there's definitely two things I want to talk about. And that's your relationship with Carter Beaufort and how you got to interview him and, and how you do videos where you break apart his style and point out stylistic, um, I don't know, things and to, to focus in on. And they, they have tons of views. And the idea of becoming a YouTube creator, a celebrated, you got the silver plaque on your wall there, which means over 100,000 people are on board with bated breath, waiting for your videos to come out. How long did that take, the YouTube thing? Any advice for people that want to do that? Tell us about what is this algorithm thing? Yeah, totally. Man, I I, I would love to talk about it because I've noticed uh, that my, strangely, um, my attitudes feel different to me than seem very common in that world. In fact, when they gave me that thing, there was like this red carpet event at their headquarters in Mountain View. And they, they call it the, the Creator Awards and they hand this stuff to like some of the YouTubers that they want to celebrate. Yeah. And I felt like such a fish out of water there. It, it was kind of the most stressed out pile of people I had ever met. It was a bunch of people going, oh, it, it, today's Wednesday and then we have to have another video next Monday and we, we don't even know what it is yet and I'm stressed out and we have to make something for the sake of making it. Oh and my God. I realized pretty early on, because you know people who are good at this stuff and successful at it say like, yo, you have to put stuff out consistently no matter what. Yeah. Uh, even if you ruin your health doing it or, uh, or if it's not very good, just get it out there. People just want to see your face. Uh, and I subscribed to that idea for a while and I kind of did ruin my mental health doing that. Um, although some... Well, what's the some, schedule? You were like one video a week? Yeah, it was so, every Monday. Okay. Um, and I was doing this stuff all by myself and I still am. I hire guys to hold the camera and point it at me if that's necessary. If Like if I can't do it with a tripod. But the rest of it I do myself. Um, which explains like the look and feel of it. You can tell it's not No, I mean, it's, the lighting is always great. The production value is great. The editing is great. Thank you, man. Well, you learn as you go. You saying that makes me realize that the first couple of videos, a lot of the, I made a new video every Monday in 2014. That was like my new year's resolution. And, uh, 
a lot of them were so terrible that they're not up there anymore, but it's not, it, but it mattered that I made them because, uh, you like making mistakes when there are consequences and stakes and all that, like it's that you carry that with you. And so, uh, the reason my last video looks and sounds the way it does is because all these other videos I made where the audio is terrible, the lighting is terrible, the movement isn't right, my pacing isn't right, my editing isn't right. That's the shame of all that adds up and then you start to make stuff that does. So it mattered to me that there was a period of making videos consistently, but I hit this turning point um, that, that I, that I uh, passed which I, I can't imagine changing my mind about this. The priority for me now is it doesn't matter how long it takes, just make things that are good uh, rather than, and you know, I've heard, look, there are guys on YouTube more successful than me. One of them who I look up to a lot is Casey Cooper, who came on your show. Yeah. And what he a said guy. the opposite of this. You know, he said like, I would believe him more than I'd believe me. Right. But maybe I'm saying all this to say like, there are multiple ways of approaching it. Don't worry if you can't crank out 55 videos a year. It's okay to just uh, make a video when you have something to say and do your best saying that thing. Um, and I, I would call it like the Bo Burnham philosophy or something, this comedian who none of us hear from but once every two years. But when it comes out, it's polished. It's exactly what he wanted. It's great. And then he is forgiven for crawling back in a hole and nobody hears from wow. him. Wow. Okay. Years. So does he, have, does he have a Netflix uh, special? A couple of those? Yes. He has a couple of Netflix specials and you can tell they're each a couple of years apart. If you look at his social media between those periods of time, he says nothing. It's he just goes time. dark. Because he's locked in some room, like working on his, like trying to make something that you can't make if you have to force it out. But That's he's probably the guy that, that is going to work out some stuff at the clubs where he insists that you put the cell phone in that little Ziploc bag. Yeah. So oh, you totally. can work. Yeah, right? Yeah, you take it on the road. I learned that the hard way, man. Like from doing TEDx Nashville, I, w one of my biggest regrets about going on stage with that talk and committing it trapping it in amber like that is that I wish I had given that talk on 30 other stages beforehand. So didn't that premiere yesterday to become available yesterday? It, TEDx? It, it's it semi premiered last night to like a, um, not quite private, but a, like a limited audience last night and it'll go on YouTube a little later. We're bickering about some editing things right now. Uh, I, but I, I imagine by the time this, uh, sitting with you airs, it will be on YouTube and you can just... That is so exciting. What was... Can you tell us what the subject was, the title? Yes, totally. I, I titled the talk Journal of a Fame Addict. It's not unlike the financial video you were asking me about. Basically, I just looked at my journalings. Uh, I, I, I journal a lot. I write, I write everything down. Um, so not smart. just the numbers, but the emotional math too. If that. Oh makes my God, sense. buddy, you're so smart because there's things that I can't remember, man. <laughs> you know? um, well, dude, I surprise myself all the time. Like if I, I, I meant to read my journal from when I, like after the weekend that I spent learning from you, like your drummer's weekend that you had in 2015, I remember writing like three pages of, I have to bottle this right away because there were so many of these subtle little influences that I want to, carry with me and a lot of them just get in your blood and you carry that around like i said about the quality of your drumming oh, like man. getting to see you play up close and you were just casually talking about doubles one time and they were so it I, doubles in my mind are like kind of irrelevant to the um the the immediate work that you do and that you're known for and sure. yet they were just like doctoral man they were it, i went like aren't they buttery smooth ah I his like, his his doubles are just like butter. Oh, thanks, guys! You're making me feel great on. today. Dude. It contributed to this theory I ha that was like kind of entering my subconscious at that time. But I preach this theory now: like successful people are not successful by accident. Um, successful you cl clues. You cannot point to Rich Redman and go like, "Oh, I guess right place at the right time." That is not how Rich Redman like locked himself in a room with the <laughs> drums and became one with them. And then he did all, there's all this like, there, there's this social level of work that goes with it too. Like I, that, that you've described a lot. I know setting up and your... tearing down drums for, for 30 years and <laughs> taking any gig. And you're like, why am I on the, at the corner of this weird tent at this weird wedding? Word. Well, dude, here's my question about that, man. Cause this is a rare, I, I bump into you in town every now and then, but this is like a rare opportunity to have an extended conversation with you. And people want to know this. Like I'm fascinated with the moment of deviation in the lives of great people such as you. So like my oh. two questions surrounding this would be, um, number one, 
what was that moment of deviation for you? The moment of unlocking like, whoa, I am Rich Redman and this is, is like, I, I, I'm going to do it. Nothing will stop me from doing this. And then, yeah, let me start with that. And then I have a follow-up question. Um, I think it was when the police released Synchronicity in 1983 and then Van Halen came out with 1984. I was like, I'm going to do That's what I'm going to do. You know, and then, you know, I was already playing drums. You know, I, already, I could already go. And then you, I had the Joel Rothman book. And you're reading, you know, variations on the uh, boogaloo beat that everybody plays on Saturday morning at Guitar Center. And then, and but I just said, I'm going to do this. You know? beat. <laughs> and was that enough? Or was there also a moment where you actually did it and you're like, whoa, I excel at this. I, I actually like. I am actually unstoppable at this. Well, people tell, I think you get clues from the universe, like where uh, teachers, band directors, fellow colleagues and musicians are like, yep, there's Redman again. He brown bags it every day. He practices before school, during school, at lunch, after school, you know, and, and so I didn't have much of a life, really. I mean, I, really I, the I, grind for you though. I mean, I'm, I'm really jealous of people that were like, I drank my face off and partied in college and I, and I just did it. But, I little, just, but I mean, you know, Vaynerchuk talks about, you know, working for 14 years for his father in the bottom of a liquor store. Yeah. You know, packing ice and doing the same kind of trajectory that you had right. or, or work ethic. That was really what it was like for you every single day. You just practiced. Every single day. And, 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 and there was a lot of great speed skating and, and, and dungeons, dungeons and dragons. And dragons? Oh, that was before that. But, yeah. but you know, you, you hear these guys, like there's a lot of guys that were like, you know, like the Matt Chamberlain's of the world that have this insane esoteric one of a kind comes along every 20 years aesthetic on their instrument. And they're like, yeah, I'm in college, but I'm not going to spend my time learning vibes, marimba and timpani. And I just said, yeah, I'm not really crazy about all this shit, but I'm just going to do it because certainly playing timpani is going to help my ear. It's going to help my touch. Um, you know, same thing with marimba. You have to strike the instrument at the right spot for it to sound good. And it affects your musicianship in a positive way. So I think, you know, the college route is not for everybody, but I, I sure feel like playing all those different kinds of music, whether it be learning, you know, you know, and then you're like, okay, now I got to work on my one, two mallet, one hand marimba roll. It all gets part of the, of your skill set and it comes out, yeah. you know, let me, yeah. play, let me, let me play YYZ one more time. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's what I did. Yeah. Well, my sense of part of how that adds up for you and your confidence, man, is that you probably don't care what people call you for. Like, you just know that you can do it at a high level because you put that time in. Or say yes first and then figure out how to do it. You know what you I know, mean? Uh, boy, do I feel that way. And I wonder how much of that I took from your playbook too. But man, I'm like known in my sort of side man circle here. Sure. I'm known as like Ableton guy. It's like, oh, you're trying to get like a really elaborate tracks rig going for your live show? Call Harry. And maybe nice. he'll even play drums. That and that's opened so many doors for me. But the first that's time cool. I did tracks for someone, I just they just asked me. I just felt like I was gonna get fired if I said no. I don't know how to do tracks. So I just said yes and stayed up all night like trying to figure out. out what a Roland SPD SX was. Yeah. And then it just evolved into like, mm, I need a little more interactivity. Let's dump this in Ableton so I can control it a little more. Okay, now let's break it into scenes. And now it's become like this big part of my life. But I, it was a yeah. thing until you make it thing. Man. But you and Mark Poise and like, you know, when I was out with Tyler Farr was out with for two years, it was like there was some of that stuff going on. And I just know that if I ever want to become an expert at that, I would rally the troops. I would shake the trees. I would go to you. I would go to Mark. I, there's like other handful of guys. And I'd be like, okay, teach this generation gap of a dude in front of you how to become a master at this. And, you know, you got to put the time in. But, you know, my gigging hasn't called for that. So for whatever reason, that's not smart. I probably should go buy it, work it. The work will come because I know how to do that, right? Or if I need it, I'll already be ahead of the learning curve and we'll have it in my pocket. But I just, I haven't needed it. Man, I hear what you're saying. I think there's like an important efficiency to, to what you're saying. I've noticed this on the drums. My New Year's resolution this year was to play every day, no matter what. Um, last year, I played 180 something shows. I was in the best shape of my life on the drums. Yeah. And I got kind of intoxicated by like, whoa, that makes me, I, I like that feeling. I want to keep it in 2020. So I played every day this year. What I noticed is if there aren't real stakes, 
if somebody isn't pointing a gun at you or holding a bag of money over your head or, or challenging you with something you're interested in, it's hard to get better at drums. Like you have to have goals, man. Wow. And so what if you just opened Ableton right now, you'd be like, I don't care. What? You know what I'm saying? Like you need stakes. You need somebody to be like, yo, we're leaving tomorrow. Figure out Ableton. I, I think that's the best way to like light that fire. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to MusiciansMortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS number 39179. NMLSConsumerAccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. So you're sort of an Ableton master. You make some money. It's a great skill set you can rely on. You have the confidence there. People can call you to put the rigs together, to do programming for them. And then it looks like you have a space. I, I think our friend Sarah Berman did a nice piece on in Modern Drummer Magazine on your place. And so you got your drums. You got your gold records and your heads on the wall. You got the mics. You're ready to go. And so... Are you are you enjoying that playing track for people around the world? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I I love the feeling of, and I don't care whether it comes out of uh, from being good at Ableton or just laying down a good groove. I I love the feeling of watching if you're as you're playing with someone for the first time at SIR, you're doing those first production rehearsals. The feeling where you see their shoulders kind of drop a little bit and go like, oh yes, I don't have to turn around. I don't have to like. I trust this guy. I can fall asleep and this guy will carry to me to the end zone. You know what I'm saying? Nice. And um, I can feel that with Ableton sometimes. You can see anxiety with other people like, whoa, she, uh, she's on the runway. She's taking selfies with people down there. We have to double this solo. Don't, by the time you look at me and have that anxiety, I already doubled the solo. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to let it fall apart. And so what do you do? St scream into a talkback? My guy's doubling the solo. Because uh, you hit you know, a pad so, to double that section, right? And totally, then, yeah. There's but, you have to have a little conversation with the computer, like go back a scene, okay, replay the scene. There's a, it matters when you tell it to do that. Uh, some of that communication is nonverbal, but uh, I love talk back gigs, man. I love having, I love being able to like talk over the music. Yeah, back here. So you're the guy. You're doing that, like guys. We're doubling the solo. Sure. Yeah. If I, um, uh, you know, those low cash fellas, especially man, it's like, they didn't like being, like you said, they came up in wild horse where you just have to, you're always having to read the crowd and make it sure. up as you go. And so if we were doing one of these festivals where they're like, like that thing we, we did in front of y'all where like, uh, you know, when Al Dean rolls, there's a, there's a runway that goes like all the way to the other end of the football field that he can run down or whatever. <laughs> and you went, sometimes we still, we were playing in these little clubs where like you can reach out and t t touch people. Touch someone, <laughs> reach out and touch someone. <laughs> I'm like sweating on people from the drums, man. And so when they, when you let those guys out and they can run down the runway, they'll do it without regard for, Oh, I'm like a mile away from the microphone and the chorus is coming back. Like, you yeah, we, it's up to us to like <laughs> keep that re reality. Well, and then they get back to the mic and they're out of breath. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. that's a, that's scary stuff. I remember when, uh, uh, my buddy Keo was, uh, J uh, Jake Owen was opening for us and Keo subbed for Myron. Keo had to not only play Myron's drums because they were bolted down, you know, to the to oh, the yeah. prizer. He had to contend with Ableton and not one, but two SPDSXs. 
<laughs> and that's a lot of pads. And he had to rehearse the pad positions and all that kind of stuff. When I did the Tyler Farr thing, I said, please, guys, no extending or doubling. Let's just play the ink, and I'll, yeah. I'll hit start and stop on the pad. Yeah. That's enough of a challenge for me because then there's got to be a light on the pad so you can see the pads that you're hitting, and oh, it's that whole other element. Oh, dude. Yeah. Those SPDs are dark. I, I had to put like fluorescent green tape yeah. on them. But what so an they, invention. I feel like it's one of the best inventions in the last 10 years, I feel like for our industry. Wow. That's, that's funny. Um, you, okay. Look, it certainly changed the game and opened a lot of doors. I have this weird tendency to not, maybe as a way of preserving my own sanity, not labeling it as good or bad. It's just different, I guess. Um, it, but man, when you crack, it's, some of it feels a little bit like if you give a mouse a cookie, when you crack that door open and it starts to get recognized like, oh, we have the capability to just have 32 extra tracks of banjo with us and we can swap the order and do whatever you want. That becomes a full-time job. I'll tell I, I, I'm, in, I'm intrigued to tell you a, a story that I still have anxiety about. So one night I was playing with an act, the front person of that act lost their voice. Mm. Uh, and we just had to get through one more show. This was like six or seven shows in a row, which is rare with Nashville acts. And they went, can you, I, th this is like the downside of people really trusting you with Ableton. We realized at 3 PM, the guy's not going to be able to make a sound. Can we take a multi-track of a show we did a week ago, dr extract the lead vocals of it, put it into Ableton, line that up with our tracks. So I'm actually Millie Vanilli triggering this guy's lead vocals. Oh and my God. First sound check. Uh, this, ha I think during sound check, we decided on this idea. And so after sound check, it was my job to go into a trailer, get, pull the multi-tracks, isolate all the vocals, chop them up, warp them to what we were doing on stage in Ableton and drop them all in. And I, there was so, there was just fi like physically not enough, you know, it's a 90 minute set. I had, uh, not necessarily 90 minutes to do all that. And so I had to trust that I was just doing it right. And we went up on stage and we muted the guy's mic. And we went up and we made it all the way to the last song. It was going perfectly. And at the very end of the last song, we hit this fermata, so to speak. And we're just, and I'm like celebrating. Yes, we did it. And then, and we were in like Des Moines, Iowa. Of course. And out of the computer, out of the vocals I had dropped in, blasting through the PA, it goes, thank you, Sheboygan, or whatever town we had been in a week ago, because I did not cut out his ad lib that he was like thanking Sheboygan. A week. Oh my God, the mic is nowhere close to his face and the PA, thank you, Sheboygan, and just blew the whole thing. I feel lucky that I did not turn that act into the next Millie Vanilli. Oh so what was the, what was the reaction from the audience? Could you feel Luckily, kind of go, like a hush? This is a, yeah, it could so have been like a voice of God thing. Like they're like, that's not him. That's just a promoter or something, you know? That's, yeah. that's so funny that you say that. So, <laughs> so um, I, two observations. One, the great thing about country music is by the time you're playing your last song, everybody is so drunk that they will never remember that any of this happened. <laughs> in the crowd, that is. Sure. If I, I were speak in the crowd, I'd But it's on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I know. Totally. Man, and look, man. there were certain people that's like, you could just see their... I think crowds think that we just see them as one big organism, organism, but like you can see people in the crowd. You can yeah. tell like if they're bored or if they're in a fight with their girlfriend or whatever. And I definitely could see the body language of a few people being like, <laughs> what said that? Minute. I have schizophrenia. <clears throat> well, just the fact that you, you rose to the occasion and accepted that challenge and got it done, except for that very last thing. Still, the, the act should be very grateful that you went into the trailer and could make something like that happen. Incredible. I mean, no. most acts just would have canceled. Oh, no, like, I know, man. Uh, yeah, uh, and I, I feel... Um, I. I, uh, I, I feel glad that I'm trusted with things like that. But yeah. when you brought up the <clears throat> SPD, that's where my mind went. I went like, man, you guys are up there doing it legit. You're just making music with your instruments. And then my, I, sometimes I feel this, this uh, weird shame tied to my own generation of like, we're sort of sucking the important... Okay, all the records I love, like the reason Blink-182 records even yeah. sound the way they sound, it's not like these guys are highly trained musicians, but the combustion of what it actually sounds like when those three guys play their instruments together is this thing that you cannot replicate. Uh, and, and it's like amazing and moving to me. And that is not the line of work I'm in. Even, even if I'm on drums playing these instruments that they inspired me to play... I cannot sit here and tell you I'm doing what Blink-182 was doing. I'm like karaokeing sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 
Interesting. You know, you know, so funny. Uh, we were telling war stories the other day. I was pretty proud of us. The same core group of guys that record on all these, um, anything that Michael Knox does, God bless Michael Knox for trusting us over the years. We did a, we did a Christmas song um, for the new Clay Walker record and we did it very traditional with brushes and, you know, bells and chimes and the, you know, the whole thing. And then we did it, let's said, let's do it like the Eagles would do it in 1973. So then we got the snare drum, you know, the cross stick and did that whole thing. And then he said, really quick, let's just try doing like a blink one two ish version. And we, this same band did all three versions of those things. So like when those kind of experiences, like, like I go, man, I love my job. Dang. Mm. I hope Legit. the music business never dies because I want to keep playing my instrument. Yeah, well, uh, yo, I mean, you're leading the way for us by like just being a master of the craft, man. And you've you've mentioned Jim Riley in this conversation sure. earlier too. You, um, the the first time, okay. So I um, uh, we toured with Rascal Flatts a little bit, and yeah, I got yeah. to see him do that stage. It made it into your videos, yeah, Jim's. Yeah, he's in there. Yeah, yeah. I I loved being able to bottle that experience. I love I love <laughs> their show. Okay, one night I went to the Five Spot and watched him play Gypsy Jazz. And he didn't even bring sticks. He played brushes the whole time. Sure. And you would think that his he was just a lifetime brush guy. Yeah. I, and that's just another one of these. It was just so, uh, it was just perfection. And that was another one of these signals to me of like, look, the guys that we look up to here in town, they're not just lucky people who got some big gig and sold 30 million records. Like they, uh, they have an actual relationship with this instrument, with the drums, man. So it's up to us to like, uh, harmonize that tone that you have set, man. So that's my goal for my generation, man, is to not lose touch with that. Oh man, you're good. Before you're coming up on eight years in town, before you know it, it'll be eighteen, and then it'll be twenty-eight, and um, you know you're just going to keep elevating things. Now, talk to talk to us really quickly about your um, your your fascination, both of you guys, with Carter Beaufort and and how why you do these deconstruction videos and how that led to you connecting with him in real life. What an amazing rabbit hole in my life. And so, and so Jim, am I picking up that you are a Carter Beaufort nut as well? I, I, at one point in time, I'm looking at all your drum sets and uh, a lot of commonalities with uh, the way you set up your stuff and the way I once set up my stuff. I, I can't sit in on Harry's kid. I mean, I'm screwed. Yeah. Well, it's a lefty <laughs> kid. Yo, I, yeah, yeah. I, my drums make people uncomfortable. So I, um, yeah, in shared drumming situations, obviously I play like traditional righty or whatever but sometimes people will sit at my drums and go why didn't i think of this sooner um, yeah. the crossing the over thing, oh uh yeah. i remember the first time i sat at drums i sat this way and some guy who was like super institutional said nah do it this way and cross your arms uh but i carter both i i owe a lot of my um drumming trade open handedness yeah yeah uh, but one of my favorite things about him, and I think one really unique thing about his voice is that he leads with his left. So the ride symbol is over here next to his hat. And it just, man, he can speak a language that the rest of us cross handers like can't really speak doing that. Yeah. And uh, boy, do I love that. I, I was like a Carter nerd first and then by, just to hear his drumming, then by proxy, I had to become a Dave Matthews band fan and go to like... 75. When did, when did you start using the X hat the, in the manner that you use it? Oh, um, to, for more than half of my drumming life now, I made that switch in like 2008. Wow. I okay, got so a, I have your beat. Oh, awesome. And so you are X hat only? This was a picture of one of my kits. I don't know if you guys can see that. Jim is showing yeah. us a picture of his kits and he yeah. has There's a two picture sets of, of my hats. I, uh, no, there's one, but it's an X hat directly in front of me. Oh, gotcha. centered. Yeah. That is from 1996. That makes even more sense to me than the way yeah. I do it. I one of the reasons I wanted to go to Berkeley was study with Mangini. Uh, yeah, who's uh, he's also like he's really into symmetry. Um, yeah. His drums reflect that. He puts the hats right in front of him, centered like that. That yeah. makes way more sense to me. I don't. Um, I don't discredit like Papa Joe Jones for mm -hmm. that. For, you, you have in 1920, you have to put all that stuff on your left because that's where you're at. But now that we've invented the remote hi hat, I wonder if 500 years from now we'll evolve into realizing like, okay, your hat symbols don't have to be on the left. Um, you don't have to create, of course, you know, a lot of this is just my uh, lack of technique. I was creating these repetitive motion injuries from crossing over the wrong way or whatever. If you just have good technique, obviously it'll go fine. Look at how many drummers are amazing at playing cross-handed. So, I got to say, watching your videos, you look like um, if uh, Johnny Rab 
And uh, Brad Mates from Emerson Drive had a child. Nice. Uh, He's too well, young for Brad Mates to know who that is, I think. Emerson Drive lead singer. You look just like him. It's kind of like the Rascal Flatts I see a lot of, of Johnny Rad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and there's, you know, the center hi-hat thing. Honestly, Rich, maybe that's something you consider. Because you've been, you, you're you always thinking about shifting things up. And, you know, uh, the SS Redmond kit certainly has its um, its look. And there's definitely recognition. Well, I, I I have the the X hat over there yeah, the X hat because open you, on this side, so you I can well, high you put stick it right in front of you. Well, I what was thinking about put right like putting it like right where the ride symbol is, and then relocating the ride symbol. But every time I try to reinvent myself in that way, like my drum tech, I love for almost like coming up on eleven years. Johnny, we one time we wanted we tried to raise the drums, change the angles, put the snare drum up higher. So because I have this little patch um, on my inner thigh where no hair grows from 45 years of, <laughs> yeah. it, it looks like a hairless cat right there, so right? you're hitting your leg. You're hitting yeah. your leg. And he goes, let's change it. So why are you hurting yourself? Why are you injuring yourself for 45 years? And we tried it for a day. It felt so no. strange. I'm like, you can't teach this old dog a new trick. Mm -hmm. You know, but I mean, but, Neil, you know, raised his snare drum up to his belly button. It just it took was, him six months to get used to it. It was very high. Yeah. Yeah. Man. But yeah. I mean, that makes sense to me. Uh, I can, dude, for a while I went, okay, what if I set up my drums righty and just try to learn, try to, I in like other words, set yours try to unlearn yeah. leading with my right and learn to, and yeah, like Rich, I had the same experience you did. I got 30 minutes in and I went, look, I already, yeah. dude, I'm, I already, uh, as you said earlier, like built a house playing the drums this way. Why don't I just stick to this <laughs> and use my time like for other things that matter you do more? It, just, you have ergonomics going for you. It's definitely kind of like a, you know, Rich has got camera appeal, right? There's practical camera appeal, so you can see you behind the drums. And then you have, you know, Nico McBrain, who's behind a wall of drums and cymbals, yeah. and you can't, you can't see him. Yeah. yeah. So, and Carter Beaufort was kind of the same way. He's, he had a very ergonomic kit. Yeah, man. He it, still plays it, dude, so if you look at, um, I could, I think 90% of my brain is dedicated to his drumming. So you're just going to have to stop me when you're so trying. So who are some of the other thing. influences though? Like, so you like, I see the influence and I saw the, everyone check out um, Harry's YouTube channel. Is it just youtube.com forward slash your name? Yeah, totally. Easy. I, I think at this point you could Google like dude drummer and it would, it would bring me up. Well, how did that all start? Because we all say dude, right? But you say it a lot. And then, but what made you want to say, a, like, uh, have that be a branding thing? Let me uh, see yeah, if I, I know, can take, I I take a stab at, a stab at answering this. Okay. Hit, hit Is me. it all the response that you get with people starting their sentences with dude? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I, okay. So dude, where's my car came out in, I'm going to say 2001. Oh my God. And you know, when a movie comes out and you're in seventh grade that you just quote that movie all week. <laughs> what, that is so cute. What, what what happened in my life is that I just never like everybody else grew out of it a week later and I never did. And so by the time I was in ninth grade, I was known as the guy that wouldn't stop saying, dude. And by the way, I was also wearing a blazer every day at that time out of that <laughs> sort of that, that minimalism mentality in my Bla life. A black and, shirt and a black blazer, which I wore today thinking that we would be matchy matchy. <laughs> well, look, I'll, uh, the, the blazers, the blazers right there. I'm experimenting with, I, I like wearing the same thing every day, not so that uh, it makes me recognizable that it's like a, a byproduct, but more, uh, I just am very inspired by minimalism. I eat the same thing for lunch every day. Just, I like saving yeah. my brain from having to calculate, like, what am I going to wear today? I want to use that brain space for other things. What do you have for lunch? Uh, I make a salad with apples and this uh, chicken that I put in the oven that comes out of the freezer. That's beautiful. It's probably... Oh, dude. Every That's like day. one of those Panera salads, but you leave off all the craisins and cranberries and croutons, anything with a crust sound you leave <laughs> off. Because we had Greg Bissonette on and he goes, you know, Ringo eats a baked potato and broccoli every broccoli. day. Cool. Isn't yeah. that such a funny through line of like these really almost like savant people? I'm not putting myself in this boat, but like I know like Steve Jobs, I found out years later, wore the same thing every day. Yeah. Similar mentality. Efficiency. It doesn't surprise me that a guy as unique as Ringo is just like mm -hmm. potatoes and broccoli every night or I'm going to kill you. Like <laughs> Bezos is the same way. He'll wear the same exact thing every day because it's efficient. He doesn't yeah. want to have to, yeah. he's got enough to think about. That well, makes sense to me. And so I've applied that to many things in my life, including, I don't know, who cares? The, it just looks like a real tidy place there. It seems like, you know, maybe you have a junk drawer, but for the most part, I feel like you keep a really clean 
environment. The key, I do. It's like OCD. It's almost like toxic levels of, oh my God. It's not, it's just the, it's the one degree short of everything has to be parallel or perpendicular. The key I've found is not being organized. The key is just not letting physical belongings into your life. People all the time, people bring stuff to your shows. Look, here's a, a Chinese wedding bell. Why don't you put this on? No, no, no. Like don't bring anything in the house, especially in Nashville culture. Like we all feel like we need to have 30 snare drums or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I've got mine down to three. I've like, been thinning uh, the herd. I'm not down that low, but mm. yeah, but definitely are you thinning. Gonna, you going to use this? <laughs> Jim <laughs> will go him over and take some gear for sure because he's still got the I've drumming. I've never done that for the record. Okay. But you're welcome to anything, buddy. Really go just yeah, head over there. Head over there to crash and grab whatever you want. You know, what's really funny. Someone, um, we got that on video. Now. This instrument designer on the West coast sent me two snare drums, um, that were made from some of the wood salvaged from the VIP boxes of the Hollywood bowl. And so I've got two Hollywood bowl snare drums here and Johnny and I are going to kind of like start. Someday. Listen, man, it's like, it's like the supplement. It's like, isn't yeah. the sound of a drum just as important as the story you tell yourself about that drum? Like, that's that really affects true. how you yeah and collectors it. love stories you know what i mean because you know we're we're not collectors you know if we don't use it we get rid of it but <clears throat> yeah. but there's a lot of people out there that are like yeah this is that you know lake superior dw drum yeah. set and it's you my know the edmund position. fitzgerald yes well this came from a boat like the edmund fitzgerald <laughs> <laughs> okay all right came from Jim. the hull uh, <laughs> we actually you know the we exhume the titanic and these shells are made out of the metal from the Titanic. I would take that. Yeah, I am sentimental about... Uh, Seasoned over 100 years at the bottom of the Atlantic. <laughs> I, dude, sign me up, man. I would pay $5 <laughs> for that. Yo, when you play Red Rocks, they give you a piece of... I in, have it. Yeah. It's form. nice. They, they give you a piece of the Red Rocks. And they're like, I kept that. That's Look cool. at man. You're 32 years old. You've already played Red Rocks. What, what are, you've done all, most of the major amphitheaters, right? The, the ones I'll the never... Sheds. Yeah. And I, man, I love those because I was, you know, we were talking about Dave Matthews band earlier. I was driving in my 97 Chevy Astra van and just sleeping in the back of it in the parking lot um, to see those guys. I like, I would get on stage on those tours and look out and, and see the nosebleeds. I'd be like, that's the exact seat I sat in to see my heroes on this stage. I, I that was like sentimental for me, man. Yeah, no, definitely. That's yeah, I don't, I don't really have any of the cool stories like that other than being at the grand opening of a brothel in Pahrump, Nevada. That, you know, I would trade all of my experiences in my life for that. That yeah. sounds amazing. A legal brothel in that state. It's legal, right? Legal. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. legal. Okay, it was, that uh, makes it yeah, less cool. Over, you, go, uh, over the, uh, you go to per, over the hump to Pahrump to get a hump. <laughs> go to Pahrump to get a hump. <laughs> no, pr- something like that. Harry, did we let you finish your story about where the dude branding or no? Did we? Because oh, we are uh, all <laughs> over the place today and I love it. I feel like there's, there's some serious caffeinated energy between us three and we want to finish all these stories, but we have like a desktop with like 18, you know, browsers open. <laughs> windows. Know, man. Tabs. That's our nature. Well, look, th- we've built this up over so many years. I, I've always known that like this conversation was coming with you, man. And I've wanted to connect with you a long time. I'll tie a neat bow on that. Um, I, I was, nobody on the internet knew my name for uh, a long time. Like I had been saying dude and wearing a blazer every day for 10 years by the time the first videos of me were coming out. And I just, that's my personality in my life. The 20 people that were in my personal life at that time uh, would tell you like, yeah, the guy just says dude incessantly and we want him to stop. And I just channeled that in the videos. It wasn't at all like, hmm, what's my thing? It became a thing. What it, the meme becomes self-aware though. When, once you have 10 videos up where you say dude at the beginning and you make dude puns and you say dude at the end. Well, now people who approach you in the airport and stuff, they say dude to you. That's awesome. And they, they like elevate they complete the circle of dudism or something. And so now I have this spiritual duty, if you will, to, oh uh, to like never stop saying it. And, yeah. um, and even your signature stick is the dude stick, right? The dude six by Vic Firth. I can't, I, well, I wasn't prepared for this, but this I love that. Happening. Did they, did they, did you pitch them that idea? Like, look at man, I got some like exposure here. Can I have some of my own wood or what? <laughs> man, it, it originally, it came from, uh, it came from a need to, so I've had like a lot of injuries in my right arm in that we, what a weird explanation for a drum stick. And uh, I, this, what I gradually figured out is the sticks I, were, I was playing were too thin. Sure. Long sticks are really rare, long drum sticks. And I wanted, um, 
you can get them in baseball bats or you can get them in twigs and nothing in between. And I just wanted a long stick that actually had like a, it's like some beef not, to it. Yeah, it's exactly, so man. So that gravity does more of the work. Uh, yeah. And I'm stressing my muscles out less. I don't know if that's how it works or not, but by feel, yo, I like, I don't, I can open doors now. There were times I'd get home from the road. I could not lift up my right arm to open a door because I was so injured. And so the need came from that and we designed this uh, stick and it just, fe it feels like an extension of my self. What's and the then, length on the stick? This is uh, not quite 17. It's um, 16 and, and three quarters. Oh, did you mean this drumstick? Yeah, no, 16 and... Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, nice. Thanks, man. Thanks. Uh, and you know, I'll, and people saw, I was, they were just going to be for me. <laughs> That's the soundtrack of my life. Uh, <laughs> these were going to be just for me, but people recognized that I would, you know, people could see them in videos and say, I want to buy those. I want to buy this. And so eventually I asked Vic like, yo, can people buy these? And, uh, we, we made it happen and you can, you can get them at Forks Drum Closet if you want them. Uh, Alex yeah. Van Halen had a really... Uh, God, how do I avoid the innuendo? He had a re has a really long stick. Yes, and uh, I tried it out. It's what, what is it? Vader, I think. It's uh, his probably uh, Regal Tip. Uh, yeah, Regal. Yes, that's right. It was. Yeah. It was either his or Tommy Lee's stick. Mm -hmm. Tommy Lee's was like playing with a tree branch. Well, we know Tommy has a big stick. I mean, we know he that. has a very big oh, stick, yeah. but I think yeah, his is over book. seventeen inches. Yeah, it's crazy. It's enormous. Yeah, there's a threshold. I mean, this is highly physical the the i don't know Dr drumsticks are so personal man uh but it's weird if you add that th th three or one quarter of an inch and you go to 17 like it's like ah oh, that's too long big difference the, the balance yeah. is off yeah but i mean are you choking up at the bottom too how much of the stick is coming out the other end yeah so uh no that's a great question and dave elish told me i was wrong for this and i believe him but kind of like rich was saying like yo i'm an old dog at this point i can't unlearn stuff I, you pretty much can't see the stick. You know, Travis, I've always noticed, it looks like he's holding the stick like this where- Halfway. Um, he's almost closer yeah. to the tip than he is to the butt of the stick. Wow, but, Travis, um, Travis Parker? Yes, just like find any picture of him playing the drums and you can see half the stick. stick well, he's a, he's a marching band guy too. Interesting, interesting. <clears throat> yeah, I, and I've also noticed he bleeds all over his drums all the time. I wonder if he makes contact with hardware a lot because he doesn't, <laughs> you know, because there's not but two inches coming out of this side of the hand. And- yeah. um. This helped me a lot with that. This helps me sit farther away from the drums. Yeah. Um, and I, keep everything lower, if that makes any sense. Uh, but I've also noticed that my, God, who cares? But I've noticed that um, <laughs> I choke up a lot more on the right than on the left. You can't see the butt of the stick at all on my left. I'm not sure why that is, but I'm so habitual that I'm, I'm not going to change that or pay any attention. Dude, no, way. I choke, I've choked. Way, I'm way back as far as you can go. Like I think Gads like that, Steve Smith. There's a lot of a lot of guys that they. I'm way back on on the stick. So the notion uh, of finding the fulcrum of the stick, you guys don't do. That's well, our the, way of doing it. I would say. Yeah. I think the fulcrum. I mean, when I think of fulcrum, I think of the uh, the thumb and the first joint of yeah. the first finger. Or where across the stick balance does you know has balance on your oh, fingers. Oh yeah. Is the fulcrum. No, I just go way back. And the thing the thing is, as I learned over the years, is that some some kids are running around learning from the from somebody that looks like Ted Reed. He's got a suit on, and it's like it's pedagogy. It's like this is how it's been done for hundreds of years. And then you got you got guys like Harry. They're just like pick up the stick. They take the lessons. They're inspired. They do their own thing. You know, the first thing like. Like, you know, talking about the old Doug, Dave Elitch, if he got a hold of me, the first thing he would want to do with me is untrain me with burying the beater. But I've been burying the beater in the kick drum for 30 so you're, you're years. You're bam like that. I do it unless it I'm is. playing jazz or folk or an open bass drum where I want want the sound to be more legato. I will intentionally pull it out. But 99% of the time, it's impact. How, I don't know how you can do that. Because, I mean, even when I try and do that, it still bounces off. No, you just got to, well, you got to just commit to destroying all of your ligaments. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, I, I've seen this up close. One time, Rich, you and I were playing loud jams and you, I think you beat on that kick drum so hard that the pedal disconnected or it broke yes. or something. Yeah. For some reason, I, I went up there and got under Oops. you and put a, I put a new pedal in or I put a new beater in or something. Thank you so much. And wow. the, the physicality, the, like be, experiencing Rich's drumming that close was like, whoa he is breaking these in half and i there, there was a lesson in there somewhere of like 
that's part of the that's part of your essence, man. We don't know what the lesson is, but I am the only drummer that plays loud jams that's got to go up there with professional duct tape and say, "Can you give me two extra minutes?" Because I tape the front spurs down so they don't move, and then I tape the pedal down so they don't move because I have some weird uh, technique with my bass drum pedal where I kind of slide to the side and it just yeah. cr- it creeps off the side. And I said, "How am I the only person out of thirty drummers tonight that this does?" <laughs> It's, I don't know. It sucks. But Jim, I know you're excited about the random question. Oh my gosh. Why do you do this to me? Well, you know, it's coming up. I know, but I got to find it first. Oh, okay. So anyways, we'll just keep talking. You want to tell us when you're ready? It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. It is the random question of the day, Harry. And you get to be asked the random (laughs) question. Hit me. The random question today, Harry, are you ready? Yeah. What happens more often than you'd like? Wow. It's a, what a funny question because I do so much work in my life to um, center my mind on what I can control and uh, not be absorbed in the things that I can't control. Uh, and so a fixation on like things that happen more than I would like. I'm, I'm in the middle of this project of like not judging things that happen more often than I would like. Uh, so what a useless answer. Um, That's good. It's an answer. That's a great answer. You're trying answer. not to judge the things that happen more often than you want to. Yeah. All the, the, that does funny things to motivation. Like, because you want to improve, you want to set a bar and go, I'm not meeting my own standards. I want to do better. I want to do better. Um, I just try and focus on those things being internal and not, because dude, in, uh, in Nashville, at the intersection of art and commerce, really, any this is true in Los Angeles too. We can conflate our self worth with how many of the of the gold plated records we get, or how many times we go to number one, or whatever. And um, what I've noticed with that, and other pursuits like it, is that uh, getting one and saying I did it, now am I worth something? Uh, it just begets more of like trying to fill that hole with that thing. Yeah. Uh, and so I, my quieter, more peaceful moments have like been in the last couple of years of my life have been more inward, gone more like I need to refine my satisfaction playing the drums when it's just me and the drums in a room. Yeah. Just like when I was 13 years old and nobody was clapping for me. I'm like in search of that right now. Getting back into your mom's basement. Ding. Going back. Yes. And I, I've, mentally, been, I've been wanting to do that. Yeah. yeah, mentally going back to the basement where there was no expectations where there was no bills to pay with, with your drumming. There was no, Oh, I better post on Instagram today or people will forget about me. Like all that, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, uh, Rich, what would your answer to the random question of the day be? What happens more often than you would like? Uh, <sighs> texts from Jim. Well, Murphy's law, you know, which the Mur- you know, Murphy's law, you have to prepare for, you know, like, ex- yeah. it, 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 I, I don't want to expect like, the worst. Inevitably but the- Kim will, Jim will call. Well, Jim, I, I do yeah. enjoy talking to you. And yeah. I feel like uh, out of our probably 15-year relationship. If something's, to, if, something's, if something's bound to go wrong, Jim will call. <laughs> That's the Murphy's Law, right? Jim is the secret weapon behind the Rich Redmond Show because he does produce about 15 other podcasts. And he is, this is a renaissance man because he's drumming, he's doing voiceover, he's producing 15 podcasts. Somehow feeding that huge family. I, I got nothing but respect for you, buddy. Thank you. Same, Jim. As you I should. Could, I run every night at 2 a.m. I run 4.1 miles and uh, you are the soundtrack to my, you, both of y'all are the soundtrack to my, my nighttime. That run. is so awesome. But why 2 a.m.? Uh, it's quiet out there. There's no cars. I live in like, I basically live in the city and it's a bustling you know what? area. I think we need to acknowledge that from here on out, Rich, that, What's that? Uh, somewhere, some, somewhere at some point, Harry's going to be listening. So that's let's great. let's let's do a shout out. We'll to give him a shout out. I think that's a great new run. feature. But yeah. two a.m. So you, shout out. You got any reflective clothing on or anything? You a little scared? <laughs> of? You got a weapon? You got some mace? What, like I uh, in true Nashville drummer form, I don't own any clothes that aren't black. So yeah. uh, I, I'm destined to be doomed one day. I yo uh, two weeks ago, I was running at three a.m. on a Saturday night by this warehouse and. Like an abandoned, a giant abandoned building that nobody has any reason to be at at 3 a.m. And I'm running by it in this car. And for other reasons and experiences in my life, even if I'm just walking down an alleyway by myself and I see somebody at the other end of the alleyway, I immediately go, that guy's going to kill me. I'm dead. This is the end of my life. So <laughs> I'm run running faster. 
I'm running by this <clears throat> warehouse and a car pulls up at 3 a.m. and the car slows down right where I am. So, there's no parking spots here. There's no reason to stop. The car stops and my mind goes to that place. I go, I'm dead. I'm never going to get to go on the Rich Redmond show, all this stuff. And the dude, the car stops and the door opens and a guy gets out and he walks right up to me and he looks right at me and I go, I'm looking into the eyes of the guys who, who guy is going to kill me. Yeah. What's going to happen now? And he looks at me and there's a moment of silence and then he leans over and just vomits everywhere all over the ground. He had just, it was Saturday night. He had just partied too hard and he didn't want to vomit in his friend's car. So he just got oh, kicked out of the car. My God. And, and it, just ha- it just happened when I was running by, but I thought I was going to die. That's my 3 So do, do you run for enjoyment or pace or distance? Like, do you go with like, oh, I got to do a seven minute mile or I'm not a good human being? Or do you um, just go to do it to burn the calories? Man, into- I, I intentionally don't time it. Uh, I, I beat that part out of me. Um, me too. Me too. I do. I run seven days a week now. And I think part of it is, uh, I feel, uh, I, I feel like it's real. I'm going to ruin my work life if I don't stay in shape or something. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, cause that, is that it, affects some people that I've worked with. That's the OCD part of you. So like, like I've got some OCD, my mom's got some OCD. Some people mm-hmm. in my life have a little bit of OCD. Are you the kind of like thing where it's like you check a lock five times, the door on your car five times, you do a rhythm of checking the oven. Like how does it manifest in your life? Like I, I check the mean. oven, bum, 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 door. One more time. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a real time sucker. It sucks. I know what you mean. I, uh, I can tell I'm that way too. I, re- before I send even a casual one sentence email, I have to read it four times before I send it. And I might not notice a mistake. Well, that's not a bad thing to do in general. Well, that's good. Yeah. It's 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 not the most efficient way, but I mean, I've been with, with rich in those different examples and man, is it fun screwing with you? (laughs) Because when you do it, I'm like, I look at you go, are you sure? I don't think a lot of I don't think a lot of people actually know Damn that about you, me. I've been I've been I've been really good at covering it all my all my whole life. But there are some little what it is 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 there's ritual tied to it, and ritual is part of our DNA. Drumming and ritual, I think, go together. So mm-hmm. it's not the worst sentence in mm-hmm. the world, but it's that, not fun. That's why they call you Ritual Redmond. <laughs> rim shot. You're crazy, uh, Jim. You got a rim shot. Nice. That's the same sample from Laugh USA on Sirius XM. If you listen, <laughs> dude. So we'll even throw in a Kelsey Grammer falling off of a stage. There we go. Oh God. So Harry, I feel like this the interview was long overdue. I feel like we can go for two, three hours easily, but it was my pleasure to pe- catch up in a public forum and to just publicly let people know that I'm really proud of you, man, and I'm so glad that you. Came here with a vision, and you are in the middle of all of it, man. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank Glad you, I Rich. You. I, dude, I owe so much of this to you uh, in the tone that you set for all the drummers here that look up to you. So thank you. It's so cool to have the opportunity to say oh, that man. on a mic. And thanks to both of y'all for entertaining me at 3 a.m. <laughs> no problem. I love it. We just well, love the fact that someone is listening. So Harry, harrymyrie.com. It's M I R double E.com. He can program your Ableton. He can play on tracks for you. You could soak up all of his lessons in real time, or you do a little one-on-one online at all, or man, I intentionally put a rest to that about five okay. years ago so Good that uh, I can spend my time actually making the things that make people want to have one-on-ones with me in the first place. Mm, Jim's got some chocolate there. Is that the, uh, the sampler, the Whitman sampler? Is it the Whitman sampler? It could be. It's C's. Oh yeah. C's chocolate yeah. is a good, good, good I mean, thing. everybody around here knows that what I need more of is chocolate. Is candy. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, you're crazy. This was so fun. I hope we covered some things and there's some great educational takeaways that uh, people picked up from this. But Harry, I'm just proud of you, man. And I hope everybody reaches out. Uh, HarryMyrie.com. And as always, Jim, thanks for your time and talent. We got two more of these to do today. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Everybody go grab their um, salads with apples and chicken or your broccoli and your baked potato. Jim, what are you going to eat? I've already eaten. Okay, there you go. Good for you, man. But I'll see you for our Johnny Rab interview. As always, thank you guys for the support out there. The Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com for your questions, for your comments. Send us a letter. We'll read it on the air. And as always, we'd love for you to subscribe, share, rate, and review. Tell a friend. Keep coming back for the good stuff. We'll see you next time. Happy holidays. Thanks, Harry. Peace, dudes. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com.